All right, so I did start recording it this way that's going. And then um, I think if you want to start, Joan, I can keep an eye on the participants and just letting one in as we go along. Great, thanks, uh, Tara. So uh, welcome to the New York Public Library. And let's let's go right there. Uh-oh. Uh, whoop, here we go. Um, so here we are on uh, Fifth Avenue but, uh, between 40th and 42nd Street. Uh, I'm sure you recognize the iconic uh, building, one of the great masterpieces of Beaux-Arts architecture. And I'll talk more about the architecture when we go inside. Uh, but while we're out here, I want to introduce our library lions. Uh, the one closest to us is Fortitude, and on the south end is Patience. And you can uh, remember which is which by 42nd Street, 42, Fortitude. Uh, why lions? Well, lions were ancient symbols of, of learning. And uh, how did they get the names Patience and Fortitude? That happened during the Great Depression. Uh, the mayor of New York City was the beloved Fiorella LaGuardia, and he uh, named the lions Patience and Fortitude because he said he wanted to remind New Yorkers that those were the qualities they'd need to get through the Great Depression. And they're also the qualities we need to get through the pandemic. And Patience and Fortitude had been wearing uh, uh, masks uh, to remind people uh, to wear their masks. Now, uh, this building, officially is named the Stephen A. Schwartzman Building and has the nickname SASB, S-A-S-B, uh, for those initials. But many of us still think of it as uh, the main branch. And uh, we're going to go inside now. And here we are in Astor Hall. Uh, this may remind you of another uh, great uh, New York City landmark. Uh, namely Grand Central Terminal. It's very similar to the, the Great Hall, but no, no constellation of the stars on the ceiling. And the library was completed in uh, 2011, Grand Central Terminal in 2013. And in the early days, people got mixed up. They'd rush into the library, go to the information desk and say, what track is my train leaving on? And uh, the confusion was natural because these are two of the great masterpieces of the Beaux-Arts style in the United States, and uh, they share some similarities. Now, what are the characteristics of, of Beaux-Arts style? Well, the term Beaux-Arts comes from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts or the School of Fine Arts in Paris, France, where most of the leading architects of the 19th century studied, and it was a neoclassical style. It looked back to the architecture of ancient Greece and Rome. So you can see here the, the pillars that may remind you of the Roman temples, and uh, it's got arched ceilings, vaulted uh, windows, and these triangles over the door known as pediments. These are all features of classical style. The main feature of classical style was symmetry. The ancients believed that all beauty came from balance and harmony. And so we have uh, two matching candelabra at the front of Astor Hall, another pair at the back. Uh, although we can only see one of the uh, sweeping staircases, there's an identical one on the other side of the library. And as you go on the tour, notice all the good things that, that uh, come in twos. Uh, including here, you see Lego replicas of patience and, and, and fortitude, obviously a smaller scale. Um, and today they live in the Children's Center, but this picture was taken in 2011, the centennial of the library. And that's when the library commissioned a sculptor known as the Brick Artist to uh, recreate patience and, and fortitude out of uh, the Legos. Now, of course, the library is more than just a beautiful building. I like to say the New York Public Library is the world's greatest tuition-free uni university because anybody can walk through these doors go into any reading room in the library and on the spot get a library card that will enable them to request any of the millions of, of books in the uh, SASB collection. Of course, they can't take the books out of the library because this is a research library, not a circulating library. But if you reserve a book in the Rosemain reading room, you get seven days to read that book. And if nobody requests it, you can keep renewing it Every time you go, you get another seven days. And I, I've read whole novels uh, in the reading room. Uh, it's a pretty good deal. 
finally, the library is also an outstanding example of democracy in action. And there's something special here in Astro Hall that illustrates that. Uh, you see that this square is outlined with a special uh, uh, black marble that makes it pop more than the other squares. Um, and that's because there's writing inside and I call it the memorial to the unknown reader, sort of like the tomb of the unknown soldier, but nobody is buried here. Uh, however, somebody was waked here and I'll tell that story uh, later. Uh, but the unknown reader does have a name, Martin Radke, but he's not exactly a household uh, word. So let me tell you a little about him. Uh, Martin Radke in 1910 was a penniless young man in Lithuania and like many people then and now, he dreamed of coming to the new world and making his fortune. He didn't speak much English, but he did have gardening skills. So he got a job as a gardener on Long Island. And within time, his English improved and he started to come to the library. And with the help of our wonderful research librarians, he gave himself a crash course in economics and finance. And Martin Radke was a brilliant student. He became a successful Wall Street investor. And when he died in 1973, he left an estate of $368,000, which in today's money would make him a millionaire, entirely to the New York Public Library. He'd never married or had children. And he explained in his will why he did this. And the trustees who hadn't been uh, previously aware of, of Martin Radke were so moved by the bequest and, and the words in his will that they actually put some of his words inside, which I'll read to you. He said, I have little opportunity for formal education as a young man in Lithuania, and I am deeply indebted to the New York Public Library for the opportunity to educate myself. In appreciation, I have given the library my estate with the wish that it be used so that others can have the same opportunity made available to me. And that in a nutshell is what the New York Public Library is all about. Our mission is to inspire lifelong learning, to advance knowledge, and to strengthen our communities. And uh, thank you, those on the virtual tour, for supporting that, that mission with your uh, presence tonight. OK, this is another view of Astor Hall. At, at Christmas time, many people come in just to see this uh, stunning tree. It's also a school break, so uh, visitors increase at, at that time. Many people come over from uh, Europe and Asia. and. Uh, we average about 30,000 visitors a day at, at this time, whereas the average uh, usually is 13,000 uh, visitors a day. But I also picked this uh, picture because I wanted a close up of these pylons. Uh, here you see engraved uh, the names of benefactors. The library has a great uh, attitude of gratitude and finds a way of thanking those who contribute. And on this pylon are the original benefactors of the library. And there are four that we consider the founding fathers of the New York Public Library. Their names are Astor, Lennox, Tilden, and Carnegie. Uh, now, I don't have uh, time to tell you the fascinating stories of John Jacob Astor and uh, Samuel Lennox, but you can look them up in Wikipedia. But they were the founders of the first free research libraries uh, in New York City. Uh, they weren't really public libraries. I call them semi-public. Uh, because although they were free, uh, they were selective. Not everybody could get in. The hours were made uh, deliberately made unfriendly to working people. The Astor Library uh, uh, even had a big sign that said no children or dogs. That was downtown in 1854. The Astor Library opened its, its doors at Astor Place and uh, Lafayette Street. Today it's the public theater. And in 1877, Samuel Lennox, uh, uh, built on the site where the Frick Collection now stands uh, at Fifth Avenue and 70th Street, the Lennox Library, which had paintings as well as books. And you needed tickets uh, to get into that one. Now, by the early 1890s, both of these libraries were failing financially. And that's where Samuel J. Tilden comes into our story. Uh, Tilden was a former governor of New York State, a progressive governor, also an unsuccessful presidential candidate. and. He shared the dream of many New Yorkers in the Gilded Age to have a true public library, one that would have a prestigious research component comparable to the great libraries of Europe, but that would also have a location and hours that were accessible to all New Yorkers, an adult lending library, a children's center, and what we consider in modern times a true public library. Now, Tilden had a fortune of over $7 million. He had no direct descendants. And he died thinking that he had made the New York uh, Public Library possible. In 1895, the 
foundations had consolidated under the name of New York Public Library, Astor, Lennox, and Tilden Foundations, which is still the official name of the New York Public Library. Uh, sadly, uh, Tilton didn't take into consideration that he had nieces and nephews who contested the will. And long story short, the New York Public Library Fund only got a fraction of the Tilden estate. There were other generous uh, donors, but it wasn't enough. I'll be honest with you, libraries are very high maintenance institutions, but I hope by the end of this tour, you'll agree with me that they're absolutely the best investment a democratic society can make in itself. So at this point, the trustees of the foundation had a brilliant idea. They went to the elected officials of the city of New York and said, would you like to create with us a unique public private partnership to create the New York Public Library? And the politicians were thrilled to be part of this uh, prestigious project. They immediately said yes. And the trustees said, that's great because you own the land uh, where we want to put the library and we'd like you to donate that. Uh, and it was the very spot where SASB now stands, uh, right adjacent to Bryant Park, which was already there. The trustees agreed with the philosopher Cicero that if you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. So Bryant Park would be the garden and the library would be adjacent. This was a, a very generous uh, donation by the city because even in those days, the land was uh, valued at $20 million. And in today's money, that would be more like $500 million. So the city also generously uh, said they would pay for the construction of the library. That was a good thing. It ended up costing a $9.2 million with the cost overruns, but nobody's ever suggested it wasn't worth every penny. And uh, you can see here, they set in stone, the city of New York has erected this building to be maintained as a free library for the use of the people. So the city made that commitment. However, what the city was not paying for, what the government was not paying for was the maintenance and adding to the collections, which is an, an expensive part of what libraries do. And that's where the, the private sector uh, came in. So now they were set, uh, there was one minor glitch that there was already a building on this spot, but it wasn't really a problem because it hadn't been used in years. It was the Croton distributing reservoir. Uh, the water system had, had moved north and they just had to dismantle the reservoir and then build the library. And of course, to do that, they needed an architect. So they held a competition in 1897. And here you see the winners. Uh, these busts are in the library. Uh, if you enter Astor Hall and go up the staircase on the right, you'll see an an alcove on the landing with this bronze bust of John Mervyn Carrere. And on the left side is the marble bust of his partner, uh, Thomas Hastings. Now, nobody expected Carrere and Hastings, who were the least well-known of the established architects, to win the competition. New Yorkers thought they knew who was going to win, the leading firm of the day, which was McKim, Mead, and White. They were the architects of Columbia University and had just built the Boston Public Library uh, to great uh, critical acclaim. But uh, it was like surprise night at the Oscars. Uh, McKim, Mead, and White were upstaged by their own former apprentices, uh, Carrere and Hastings. Now, Carrere and Hastings had met as students at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. They trained under McKim, Mead, and White for three years. And then they decided to go off on their own. Uh, uh, so they formed a partnership. And Hastings' father was a very well-connected society minister. And his parishioners and friends became their first clients. So they were designing luxurious homes for the wealthy. But they were idealists. They belonged to a movement uh, known as the City Beautiful Movement. And although probably nobody in the City Beautiful Movement was familiar with the concept of, of Feng Shui, it in fact had the same central organizing principle, namely that we're all very influenced by the energies of our environment. And the City Beautiful Movement believed that if you built beautiful public buildings, not only would you make people feel better, but you would make them do better. You would be promoting civic virtue. So they were absolutely thrilled to get the library as their first major uh, civic uh, commission. And they vowed that they would create a people's palace of learning. And the people's palace is still the nickname of, of uh, the Schwarzman building today. Uh, now this took, it takes time to build a, a palace, which was, it turned out to be the largest marble structure of its day. And this one, it took a dozen years. It took 500 workers, two years just to, uh, tear down the reservoir and then another 10 years to uh, construct the library. But finally, on May 23rd, 1911, exactly 16 years to the day from the consolidation of, of the foundation, 
they had a dedication ceremony. And this was such a big deal. It was front page news in all the newspapers that the dedication was performed by the president of the United States himself. That was William Howard Taft, who came up from uh, Washington, DC to talk about the national and historic uh, importance of the New York Public Library, where anyone, no matter what their origins or their socioeconomic status, could have access to all learning. And as Francis Bacon said, uh, knowledge is power. So the next day, the library opened for the first time to the, the, the public and an estimated 50,000 visitors streamed in that, that first day, which you know, was truly an amazing number. And perhaps even more impressive, the first book was delivered to the first patron in under seven minutes. So New York had arrived on the cultural map with a state-of-the-art world-class public library. And I say state of the art because this was one of the first buildings in New York City to have both elevators and electric lights. So the libraries continued to expand. I, this, this picture shows part of the latest addition uh, to the library, the only above ground structure added since 1911, the South Court building. But before I talk about that, uh, I wanna let you know that although uh, SASB is still the jewel in the crown architecturally, Today, it is not the only New York Public Library. It is one of 92 individual public libraries uh, that are New York Public Libraries. Now, they're in only three of uh, New York City's five boroughs, Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island. Why not Brooklyn and Queens? Well, in 1895, Brooklyn and Queens were invited to join the New York Public Library, but it would be another three years before New York City was actually incorporated as a city, and Brooklyn and Queens hadn't been waiting around. They had their own independent library systems, and when people have independence, they don't lightly give it up. So they said, no, thank you, and they're still saying it today. Both Brooklyn and Queens have uh, major uh, impressive public library systems, and there is some interlibrary cooperation and book operations and things like that, but they have remained independent and you cannot take out a book from an NYPL branch library with a, a Brooklyn or Queens card. However, the good news and, and for you and, and Rye as well is that anybody who lives or works anywhere in New York state, not just the city, but the state can get a New York public library card free of charge that will be good for the circulating libraries. Um, and anybody from anywhere in, in the world or even another planet can use the research libraries. So, uh, the branch libraries, the founding father of the branch libraries was Andrew Carnegie. In 1901, he gave $5.2 million and that seated the first 37 of what have grown to be 88 uh, branch libraries. Now the largest one is, is across the street from SASB and half a block south. It used to be known as the Mid Manhattan Library, but uh, it's now been renamed the Stavros Niarchos uh, uh, library and it was supposed to open with a big gala on May 17th. Obviously the pandemic changed that, but uh, it is uh, open for grab and go now. And the, the library is gradually reopening. SASB itself is by research appointment only and will reopen again in September. And there will be uh, tours again in, in September. Um, you know, that's the plan for now. You can check on the website nypl.org for updates because uh, things are always changing. Um, so, as I said, this, this uh, building, the South Court, was added in uh, uh, 2001. Uh, in, the, in 1911, there was a grassy courtyard, the South Courtyard, and in those days, the horses were still the major form of transportation, so people were tying up their horses in the courtyard and then coming into the library to work. Well, over time, the courtyard had other uses. Uh, it was at one time a, a, a general store for the em employees, uh, but by the uh, 20th century, it was pretty much dead space. Now, our far-seeing librarians knew that a digital revolution was coming and they wanted to be prepared. So the library hired the architects uh, Davis Brody Bond in the early uh, 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 2000s to create South Court into which went the first digital learning labs in the library, as well as classrooms. On the concourse level, there's an auditorium with many wonderful uh, public uh, programs, most of them uh, free to the public. Um, and the, what we're seeing here is this, the staff uh, offices. Now, I also like to show uh, visitors that when Davis, Brody, and Bond excavated the foundation, they deliberately left uh, part of it open 
so that uh, visitors could see that here are the original stones from the, the Croton Reservoir. They wanted to honor the library's uh, previous uh, uh, existence uh, and, and uh, you know, honor its, its, its heritage. So these stones came from the Croton Reservoir. So uh, now we're going to leave South Court and go down the North-South Corridor toward the periodical room. Yes, you can. And uh, please mute yourself. Um, while we're here, I want to talk a little more about the, the building. You may notice that this marble looks a little different from the, the marble in uh, Astor Hall. That marble was a stark white, and if you're actually in it, you can see there are black veins running through. And the marble in Astor Hall is a white Vermont marble that's identical to the marble on the outside of the library, which has a marble facing that goes a foot thick. Um, and Career and Hastings requested the Vermont quarries at Dorset and Danby to only send their very finest white Vermont marble. And they sent only the finest, but the architects were so fastidious that they rejected 65% of the finest marble. Now we don't need to feel too sorry for the rejected marble. Uh, it did find homes in, in many other distinguished buildings, including Harvard Medical School, but Career and Hastings weren't impressed. They said, well, it may be good enough for Harvard. It's not good enough for the People's Palace. We only want the very best. And this marble in the north-south corridor is what they considered the best of the best. It's a Greek pentalic marble that is identical to the marble in the Parthenon temple in, in Athens, the great uh, temple of classical learning. And we feel fortunate to have it because that quarry is now depleted. You can't get this marble anymore. Uh, now, next, I usually ask people on the tour what they think the ceiling is made of, and they almost always say wood, sometimes uh, uh, copper. And that's exactly what the, the architects wanted you to think. However, uh, it's molded plaster that's been stained to look like wood and painted with a special gold paint that gives that coppery effect. Even the magnificent ceiling, uh, uh, coffered ceiling in the Rose Main Reading Room is molded plaster. We only have one real wood ceiling in the library. It's in uh, Gottesman Hall and we're going to get there on this tour. Uh, but why didn't they use wood ceilings everywhere? Well, remember, there had been a reservoir here previously and the ground was damp. And the architects were afraid that over time the ceilings might warp and uh, it would be prohibitively expensive to replace them and their artistry would be lost to future generations. So they created these wonderful uh, faux wood ceilings. Uh, when we get to the periodical room, notice the, the, the ceiling there, which is one of my favorites. Uh, they also uh, created these beautiful light fixtures. And when the library opened in 1911, there were no tall buildings. So you have windows on either side that really let the light stream in. And the whole message of the library was let there be light, which is exactly the message a library should be giving. Sadly, then the skyscrapers went up and uh, uh, Thomas Hastings uh, was irate. He became known later in life as the foe of of skyscrapers, but they had anticipated that this might happen and they deliberately built the library on a terrace that would mitigate uh, uh, some of the, the damage. But uh, although these are the original light fixtures because uh, of the darkness that this, the skyscrapers bought, the library did install uh, another row of lights here. And uh, uh, hopefully one day like the Met Museum, they'll get some spotlights that will brighten it up uh, further. So. Uh, let's go on to the, here we are in the periodical room with the beautiful ceiling, um, not wood, and see these, these walls are real wood, they're French walnut, and you really can't tell which is the, the authentic wood and, the, and the, the faux wood. Now, what do you find in the periodical room? Well, you find the most requested English and foreign language newspapers and magazines, so the New York Times, Paris Match, and of course these days the thousands of, of uh, periodicals sometimes exist only in electronic form, sometimes in both hard copy and, and electronic form. What if you want older material? Well, then you, you go to the, uh, or less requested uh, material, you, you go to the Rosemain reading room, either they bring it up from the stacks or they send you to room 119, which is the microfilm room if it's on uh, microfilm. So uh, many people just come in to uh, sit and work on their laptops. There, there's no law, you have to be using a periodical because this is one of the nicest and most intimate uh, reading rooms in the, the library. Now the room is named after DeWitt Wallace, who was the founder of the Reader's Digest magazine. 
And the Reader's Digest was actually born in this very room. In the 1920s, DeWitt Wallace and his wife Lila lived in Greenwich Village. And on their way to work, they uh, stop at the periodical room and, and read a, a variety of publications. And one day, DeWitt Wallace realized that nobody got to read all the very best articles because they weren't just in two or three uh, publications, but scattered among hundreds. So he proposed to Lila that they come and copy the best articles edit them so that they'd all fit into one volume and call it the Reader's Digest. She thought it was a great idea. Uh, that's exactly for the first three years of, of its existence, they made the Reader's Digest in exactly that way, Witt and Lila uh, copying the articles and editing them. And it took off. Uh, when I was a child in the 1950s, every doctor's waiting room had a copy of the Reader's Digest and it was second in sales only to the Bible. So when they became wealthy, the Wallaces uh, formed a philanthropic foundation. And in the early 80s, when uh, the periodical room needed a, a total uh, renovation, the DeWitt Wallace Foundation paid for the renovation and the room was named after him. And one thing the foundation did was they, they uh, engaged a, a commission to a living artist, uh, Richard Haas, who is still uh, very uh, esteem for his architectural paintings to create these murals so that you feel when you come through these doors, you've stepped back in time uh, to the heyday of New York publishing. Uh, Haas uses a technique called trompe l'oeil, which is French for fool the eye, so that you really feel like these buildings are, are coming off the wall at you. And they're all monuments to the, the publishing industry. You may recognize this as the iconic New York Times building that stood in Times Square for many years, looks a little like the Flatiron building. Over here, we see all the, the great book publishers are shown in their original buildings. This was what's now Harper Collins, then it was Harper and Brothers down on Pearl Street. And uh, this was Herald Square where they, they published the, the Herald newspaper. Uh, there's a doorway like this one, which has a, a, a mural over the door that is a little pink building that was the Reader's Digest building uh, near Pleasantville, uh, New York. So that's the periodical room. And then when you go through that, that doorway with the uh, Reader's Digest on top, you come to the DeRoke collection. Uh, this is one of what the library calls its special collections. It's the only one on the first floor. The others are on the third floor. And they're all closed to the public with the exception of the art and architecture uh, collection, uh, which I'll talk about uh, later. Um, but uh, Durot is a Hebrew word meaning generations and the Durot collection is the library's outstanding collection of Hebraica and Judaica. Uh, the core collection was donated in 1897 by the Schiff family. And today it's added to and maintained by the Durot Foundation. And that's where the name comes from. It's about 40% in the Hebrew language most of the modern languages as well as Yiddish and Ladino are represented. And to give you an idea of the holdings on the scholarly side, they have the first Hebrew prayer book published in the United States for the Harvard Divinity School students. And on the popular side, they have recipes for bagels, Winnie the Pooh and Sherlock Holmes in, in Yiddish. And they also have some valuable artworks, including some beautifully illuminated uh, uh, ketubit or wedding uh, certificates from the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, they also, as you can see, have LED uh, uh, lighting to brighten it up. And because of the open doorway, the librarians are very indulgent about people kind of peering in to see what's going on. Although technically the special collections are, are supposed to be used only by approved researchers. Now we go down the hall to, and come to Gottesman Hall, which is one of two exhibition uh, galleries in the library. The other is much smaller. It's the Wackenheim Gallery, and that's directly across from, from South Court. Because of the limited gallery space, they also use the corridors on the third floor for, for exhibitions. But Gossman Hall now is, is they have just set up a, what will be a permanent exhibition. I'm very excited to see it in September uh, when they open and we docents will be giving tours. It's called Treasures of the New York a Public Library. And they're, they put on, on permanent display and there'll be some rotation, but the things that people really want to see, for instance, the library owns the first Gutenberg Bible brought to the United States by uh, Samuel Lennox and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, James Lennox. And uh, uh, that has been uh, for years inaccessible. It's, it's been in the rare books uh, uh, collection, but now it will be on permanent display. Um, 
as you can see, this is a beautiful room and it's also used for corporate parties and weddings, which is one of the ways the library continues to raise money because it is still a public private partnership. The New York Public Library is not like the, the Library of Congress of uh, a government library. Uh, the funding is still about 50-50, but these days the government uh, basically funds the, the circulating libraries and from the private sector come most of the funds for the the research libraries. So as I said, this has the only real wood ceiling in the, the library. You see it's a beautiful carved oak ceiling in Renaissance style by a famous sculptor of the day, uh, Maurice Greaves. And now we come to the map room, which is similar in layout to uh, the periodical room. And this is one of the top five uh, map collections uh, in the world. And it's used by the media and the military, as well as people like ourselves. It is a public uh, reading room and it's worth a visit. They have over 500,000 sheet maps, about 20,000 books and atlases, and every kind of uh, uh, map you can imagine. Now, they also have some interesting globes. On this one, New York City no longer exists. It's, it's ginormous and people make a beeline, put their finger on the spot and say, here we are in New York City. So New York City was worn away and now there's a shiny white spot where, where New York City used to be. Now, once I, I was giving a private tour for Lyndon Johnson's great granddaughter and her father, and she was very interested in uh, astronomy. So the uh, curator brought out their antique uh, maps of the constellations and uh, then told us they also have uh, on the other side, the, the latest rendition of the homes of the stars in Beverly Hills, so two, two kinds of stars. Now, the strength of the collection is, as you might expect, in New York City maps from the time of the early Dutch settlements. They have priceless 400-year-old hand-drawn uh, maps uh, of those, and also they have the latest subway map, which you can take with you. If you go down the corridor, uh, there's a long corridor, and then you come to room 121, and this is the Milstein Division of US History, Local History, and Genealogy. It's unique in the library in that it has open stacks. You don't have to fill out a call slip, but you can uh, take a book off the shelf, sit at a table, and, and uh, uh, read it to your heart's content. However, you cannot take it out of the room. It's not a circulating library. Um, but they have both scholarly and popular works of history. It's also a top genealogy center and free of charge. If you want to use ancestry.com, you can do it here without paying for it. But better yet, you can get a free appointment with a, a research librarian trained in genealogy who will help you navigate the birth and death indexes, the manifest uh, from Ellis Island and other documents to help you find out more about your ancestors who, who came to this country. Now we're going down to the ground floor. The, the library is, it uses the European system uh, of numbering. So if you come in on Fifth Avenue, you're on the first floor, but if you come in on, on uh, 42nd Street, you, you come in uh, to the, the ground floor and uh, that's where the Children's Center is. Now I believe the Children's Center is, has moved to the Stavros and the Arcos when, when the library reopens, it won't be here anymore, but this is how it was uh, when it closed at the pandemic. And as you can see, uh, it is home also to, to Winnie the Pooh and friends. Now this is a circulating uh, library for, uh, they have over 47,000 books and other items for children up to the age of 11. And uh, uh, the 100 acre wood was painted so the animals would feel at home. But how did Winnie the Pooh get to the New York Public Library? Um, and, and by the way, Winnie and his friends will be in that treasures uh, exhibit uh, when the library reopens. Well, it's kind of a sad story, uh, uh, the journey of, of Winnie and friends. Uh, Christopher Robin, the son of A. Milne, who wrote the Winnie the Pooh books, became estranged from his father in adult life. He felt he had been exploited in the Winnie the Pooh books and he didn't want anything to do with them. And he didn't want his... Uh, Animals, uh, once beloved, they were painful reminders uh, uh, of what he considered his exploitation. So he donated them to his publisher, E.P. Dutton, who gave them to the library so people like ourselves, who, for whom Winnie was a cherished part of our childhood, could come in and visit him. And uh, one year they had to send uh, them to the animal hospital for uh, repairs and Winnie had complications from stomach surgery and the animals have to all travel together because 
purpose of insurance purposes. So for a year, there was no Winnie and people were very upset. They were coming in all the, all the time saying, when is Winnie coming back? Now they're all here except uh, for Rue, you may have noticed. Apparently the Milnes went in a, a picnic, Rue fell out of Kanga's pouch and was never seen again. Now we go up to the second floor and most of the rooms on the second floor are not open to the general public. They're dedicated uh, uh, for the use of scholars and writers and there's a lot of competition to, to get a place in these rooms. But there is a central portion known as the Joe Cup and Rose Gallery that is open to the public and it's worth a visit, especially as a supplement to the tour to find out more to see uh, pictures and artifacts uh, that are mentioned on the tour. Uh, there are pictures both of uh, the Schwarzman building, you, you can see what the library looked at before the lions came, they were put in at the last minute. Um, and uh, also there are artifacts from the branch libraries and they also have special exhibitions. This was one on immigration uh, here. And now we go up to the third floor. Uh, the library, by the way, during the pandemic, they are doing renovations. So when it, it reopens, they will have not just one elevator, but two. There will also be a restroom on the first floor that's open to the public, which uh, has been a, a lack up, up until now. But there'll still be this, this elevator, which is also going to be renovated when the other one is in, in place. And as soon as you get off it, you see into this glass door, this is your view of the Berg collection, which is my favorite collection of the library. It's, it's one of the greatest collections of British and American literature in existence. And it, it goes from the 15th century uh, to the present, but the strength is in modern literature from the 19th century on. Now the story of the Berg collection is it was the gift of the, the man in this painting, Dr. Albert Berg, in loving memory of his brother, Henry, who was much older and had really raised Albert. And they were uh, physicians at Mount Sinai Hospital, lifelong bachelors who lived together until Henry's death. And they also speculated very successfully in real estate. And with their real estate uh, winnings, they indulged their mutual passion uh, for rare books. So when Henry died, Albert then bought two other uh, rare book collections and donated them all to the New York Public Library. Um, now, the Bergs were particularly fond of Charles Dickens. And so what you see, everything you see here, except this flower uh, belong to Charles Dickens. We have one of his, the original manuscript of one of his great masterpieces, Bleak House, and also all of Dickens' personal copies of his books. Uh, he marked them up for his dramatic uh, readings that he gave across the uh, United States and England. He, he had been an actor and was aware that what reads well on the page doesn't necessarily make for the most uh, dramatic of reading. So he edited and we have all those copies with his handwriting and every Christmas there's an exhibit uh, uh, built around the prompt copy of the Christmas Carol. Here the calendar is open to the date of Dickens uh, death and this desk and this chair uh, uh, both belong to Charles Dickens. Now in 1940 when the Berg collection was dedicated, Mayor LaGuardia performed the dedication and sat in the Dickens chair. If you've seen pictures of Mayor LaGuardia, you know he was a rather portly man. And halfway through his dedication speech, the entire bottom fell out of this cane chair. So the library had it recaned, but from that day forward, nobody, not even the very petite current curator of the Berg Collection gets to sit in the Dickens chair. It's strictly for viewing only. Okay, so we continue down the hallway past uh, the other uh, special collections that are behind closed doors. Only one other has a glass door, the Fortzheimer uh, collection, which is devoted to Shelley and his circle. So you can uh, peer in there, in there. And then we come to what's known as the McGraw Rotunda, even though it's not strictly speaking a rotunda. A rotunda should be a perfect circle. This one is rotunda-ish with kind of square corners. Now you see these paintings, they were not in the library in 1911. They were added during the Great Depression as part of the federal art project. As you know, many people were unemployed uh, during the depression and we had the WPA or Works Progress Administration to find work for the unemployed. And since artists were also unemployed, the WPA included the federal art project which commissioned artists to decorate public buildings. Now the lucky uh, artist who got this commission was named Edward Lanning Jr. And he was so grateful that to his credit, he. He immortalized that, that gratitude with uh, a thank you letter that's actually painted right into this uh, uh, mural. It's addressed to Isaac Newton Phelps Stokes, who 
was both a trustee of the library and a head honcho in the WPA. And he was instrumental in gaining, uh, landing the commission. And also because Phelps Stokes uh, was wealthy, he personally paid for all the expensive artist material, the oil paints, the canvases, the brushes. And there's a wonderful John Singer Sargent portrait of Phelps Stokes and his wife in the Metropolitan uh, Museum of Art, if you uh, happen uh, to be in there. Now, unfortunately, Lanning was not a great artist like uh, Rich Richard Haas is, uh, I think, a much more talented uh, artist. This sort of reminds me of the, the Soviet art of the Stalinist era, but uh, he was good hearted and he tells a great story. There are four murals and they tell the, the history of the recorded word in the West. Now the two that we can't see, the first one, it begins with Moses bringing the stone tablets containing the 10 commandments down from Mount Sinai. The second one is a medieval monk copying a manuscript. Uh, this one celebrates the Gutenberg Bible. It shows uh, Johannes Gutenberg proudly holding up the first uh, uh, Gutenberg Bible to show his patron, the Elector of Mainz, Germany. And Gutenberg invented movable metal type in the West. It had been invented in Korea 200 years earlier, and before that they had movable porcelain type in China, but Gutenberg didn't know that. And we really owe him a great debt. He, he went broke <laughs> as a result of his, his uh, uh, printing efforts, but thanks to him, uh, not only the elite could read, but he, he really uh, made, made possible mass market uh, reading. Now here we celebrate uh, Otmar Mergenthaler, who was the inventor of the linotype machine, which made possible the mass circulation newspaper. And uh, the man reading the newspaper is James Whitelaw Reed, who was a famous uh, newspaper editor of the day. Now today they'd have to have a mural celebrating the internet and the computer, but I don't know where they put it. So good thing they didn't have it then. Uh, Lanning did paint these two lovely lunettes over the, the doorways. The other doorway, which is the Bill Blast catalog room, has a lunette showing a mother reading to her young son, and it's called Learning to Read. This one is called The Student, and uh, it's a young man reading to himself. And we library docents have decided the student is supposed to be the little boy grown up. They do resemble each other. And we think Lanning wanted to give a message to parents. Read to your children so they grow up to be readers. Now. Both of the doorways are framed in this beautiful rose-colored mar marble, which comes from the south of France. It's called Rue Jasp, and it's one of the most costly marbles uh, used in the library. We're going to go through this door, and we find ourselves in the Ed Edna Barnes Solomon Room. As you can see, it's often used for, for uh, parties, but by day, it's a reading room, like all the reading rooms wired for Wi-Fi, and you see people working. And it's also the library's official picture gallery. You can see uh, paintings are arranged as in a 19th century picture gallery. We have two portraits of George Washington, not by Gilbert Stuart, but by his, uh, at the time, uh, equally famous contemporary Rembrandt Peale. And there are some Stuart Gilbert portraits of the Lennox family. There are a lot of portraits of the Astor and the Lennox family, but there are some famous artists represented, including Sir Joshua Reynolds. And uh, among the more recent donations, uh, Truman Capote not only donated all his papers to the library, but also a lovely uh, portrait of himself. Now people get to the third floor and they see the two doorways and they're puzzled because they came to see the main reading room and neither of these doorways seem to lead into it. So they ask at the information desk and they're told you have to go through the Bill Blast catalog room. And then once you go through here, you get to the book delivery system and you turn left and you're in the South Hall of the Rose Main Reading Room uh, uh, because actually not only is the reading room hidden, but there are two reading rooms. Remember that, that principle of symmetry. There's a, a North Hall, an identical South Hall, and it's actually a very efficient way to deliver books because the librarians can just turn around and serve the, the clients on the two sides at, at once. Now, the Bill Blass catalog room is named after the fashion designer Bill Blass, who was a trustee of the library and in 1994 gave the library the most generous donation uh, to that date, $10 million. Uh, he's been eclipsed by Stephen A. Schwartzman, who gave $100 million, and that's why the building is now named after him. Uh, but uh, they did name the catalog room after Bill Blass. Um, and what you don't see here are the old fashioned card catalogs with the wooden boxes and little cards. When I was a student using this library, they did have that. Um, 
but it's been replaced by these desktop uh, computers next to which are little boxes with call slips. Because there are only two things you can do on the desktop computers. You can use a computer free of charge in the library, but that's a laptop. You can borrow a laptop for, for 45 minutes at a time. And on, these computers will only let you do two things. You can surf the catalog of the New York Public Library to get the call number of the book you want to request. And there's a special app to request a library card. Now, at the end of uh, the uh, Bill Blass catalog room, is a beautiful carved uh, doorway. And you see some of the classic ornamentation from the Beaux-Arts style, the rosette symbolizing uh, beauty and the ubiquitous acanthus leaves uh, symbolizing immortality. There's also a quote from John Milton, a good book is the precious lifeblood of a master spirit embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond life. And although Milton is most famous for Paradise Lost, this is actually not from a poem, but from his famous defense of free speech, the area Pagetica. The library has one of the rare first editions of, of that book. And you may have also noticed in the Berg collection, there's a white marble bust of, of Milton. There's also a painting of him uh, in uh, the Solomon Room. And, and he's sort of the presiding genius of, of the New York Public Library, or patron saint, uh, which is fitting because he was a great uh, defendant, defender of, of free speech. Now we come to the book delivery system. This was completed in uh, 2016. It's like a roller coaster with metal tracks and these cute little red cars can each hold up to 30 pounds of books. And when they tip, the books do not tip out of them. They actually make five stops in the library. The, the reading room is the last of their, their stops and that's how they, they bring your book up from the stacks. Now the stacks are no longer the original stacks, which I'm gonna show you in a, in a minute, but the books have all been moved to 80 miles of, of uh, book stacks that exist under Bryant Park where that grassy lawn is that becomes the skating rink in the winter. There are now two tiers, 40 miles each of, of book stacks and that's where uh, the millions of books in the, in the collections exist. The capacity of the, uh, they call them the Milstein stacks after the generous donors, Howard and Abby Milstein, uh, uh, they uh, can hold up to four and a half million uh, books, but they're up to about four million now. You always have to leave room, room to grow. Now, these are the original st stacks and you can see they're architecturally very important because they hold up the Rosemain Reading Room. So they're, they're still there and they use them temporarily when they're setting up an exhibit as swing space. They, they store the exhibit materials here uh, until they're ready to set up the exhibit. But as you can see, there are windows and in the 20th century, they discovered that you need to climate control stacks. Otherwise, especially the older material, not on acid-free paper, will deteriorate over time. So it would have been problematic to try to climate control stacks with windows. It was much more cost-effective just to start over under Bryant Park. Uh, and uh, so they created the new stacks. And uh, they also have those, those stacks that kind of swing out uh, you press a button and they swing out and then they swing in where you, you can hold uh, more books. And uh, there's a murder mystery, Lethal Legacy by Linda uh, Fairstein, in which a body is hidden in, in one of those uh, 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 book stacks. With the, they're perfect for, for hiding a, a body. Um, now we finally come to the reading room. And uh, uh, this is the, the South Hall. And I don't know if, if you're aware, but uh, both the reading room and the catalog room were closed for two years because in May 2014, this rosette came crashing down. Luckily, it was 2 a.m., so nobody was injured. Miraculously, it fell between tables, so uh, uh, even the furniture wasn't much damaged, but it was a wake-up call. They realized that these 900 ornaments had been glued on with the best glue of the day in 1911, but after 100 years, even the best glue will dry up. So engineers determined that they, they needed to uh, uh, bolt everything onto the ceiling. So for two years, the rooms were sealed off. This was highly skilled work and, and they did that. They also installed LED lighting and they restored these beautiful pointing paintings of the, the morning sky. Uh, now the original paintings were done by James Wall Finn from the Tiffany studio, uh, but they had deteriorated and the Evergreen studio did a great job of, of reproducing them. Now, why do we have the morning sky on the ceiling of the library? This was one of many innovations of the library's first director, Dr. John Shaw Billings. I don't have time 
to tell you more about him, but look him up in Wikipedia. He was a great man. And it was his greatest innovation to put the reading room on the third floor. Usually in 1911, you walked into a library, the first thing you saw was the reading room and Dr. Billings said, that's all wrong. It should be uh, as far as possible from the heat, dust, noise of, of the city. And he wanted the morning sky so that readers would look up and feel as if they were looking into the heavens and become uh, inspired. Now the Rose main reading room, the two rooms are the size of an American football field or two very long city blocks. About 540 people can sit at these tables at, at uh, one time. Uh, uh, sadly, uh, John Mervyn Career did not live to see uh, the library uh, opening. I told you somebody was waked in the library. Well, uh, two months before the official opening, Career ironically went to see Thomas Hastings who had uh, typhoid fever and his survival was doubtful. Well, he did survive, but on his way home, Carrera was killed in a freak streetcar accident. So they decided that in March, in advance of the official opening, they, they would wake him in Astor Hall for a week. And he was much beloved, 2, 000, over 2,000 people came in to pay their respects uh, to the generous spirit who gave uh, New York this, this wonderful uh, palace of learning. And I like to think that the library is still haunted today by the beneficent uh, spirit of, of John Mervyn Career. Now, you all know the library as a venue of great learning, but one thing you may not know about the library is it's also a venue of, of romance. Uh, weddings take place in the library. If you saw Sex in the City, uh, the movie, uh, you may remember the McGraw Rotunda is the place where Carrie Bradshaw waits in her wedding, group, wedding dress. She's supposed to marry Mr. Big there. They end up getting married uh, elsewhere because he didn't show up for the first wedding, but I have seen uh, actual weddings in, in preparation. It's more expensive uh, than most of us can afford to get married in the library, but the good news is anybody can get their wedding pictures taken for free in any room that they want to or on the steps, and I, I frequently see that as well. Uh, and we even have a special tour that we call the Lovebird Tour because people call up and say, I, I'd like to propose in the library. Uh, uh, can I do that? And this corner uh, of the uh, library is a lovebird corner where proposals may be made. Uh, they, they are given their own private tour with a dedicated docent. And one enterprising young man got the library's permission to create a fake book. There are green encyclopedias similar to, to these uh, uh, in the lovebird corner. So he had a fake book made that was hollow inside and he filled it with pictures of himself and his fiance. And when he got there, opened it up and reminisced with her about all their good times and he got in one knee and proposed. And of course she said, yes, at once. To my knowledge, nobody has ever been turned down on a leopard uh, tour of the library. So if you're thinking of proposing or know anybody who is, please keep that in mind when the library reopens. Now, uh, finally, the art and architecture library, if you keep going here, you see two uh, swinging brown doors. They go into room 300, which is the art and architecture library, the one special collection that is open to the public and it's worth a visit. They have over 600,000 items, everything to do with applied and fine art and including original fashion sketches, auction uh, catalogs, Thomas Hastings, scrapbook of, of uh, buildings that he admired in New York City. So I think uh, we're running out of time here. So I'm gonna end the tour and open it to questions, but thank you. And, and if you have any questions, after the, the tour, if you have any questions about anything, it doesn't have to be about the library. I want you to know that we have a free uh, uh, telephone reference. You just call 917-ASK-NYPL. I can't remember the numbers, but those are the letters. And uh, they, they are staffed by professional research librarians who can answer uh, questions about just about anything. So thank you. I'm gonna stop the share. And uh, if anybody has questions, thank you, Tara. No questions? Oh, uh, should we unmute people? No, I'm muting myself. How do I, I don't know how to unmute people. Um, we can ask them to unmute, but so we, okay. uh, if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute or you know, raise your hand if you need help. I can help unmute you as well. All right, then, yeah, yes, Abby. Oh, you're muted. Oh. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I, I lost the end photos because my phone rang. Um, could you touch upon um, the room that has uh, 
I don't know if it's only Virginia Woolf or Bloomsbury writers. Oh yes, that's the Berg collection. Uh, that, that now you know they keep adding to the Berg uh, collection, and they now have the world's uh, uh, finest collection of Virginia Woolf. Uh, there were some recent acquisitions. They even have her walking stick that she used when she walked into the river to uh, commit suicide. Uh, uh, also, W. H. Auden. Um, and other Bloomsbury. They have uh, Lewis Carroll, a wonderful collection, including the volume that he inscribed to the original Alice for, for Alice in Wonderland. Uh, Walt Whitman, I mean, just incredible uh, treasures. I have I've a fantasy that one day there'll be a blizzard when I'm doing a tour and they'll say, well, uh, we don't have any beds, but you can sleep on the floor of the library in your favorite collection. And I, I would go and, and sleep with the ghosts of all, all the great, uh, writers in the English language. <laughs> they also have the archives of the of the Abbey Theater there. Oh, I've always wanted to visit it because my son collects Virginia Woolf first editions, but I haven't gotten. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you for the the compliment, Judy. Or any other questions, Lynn? You have any questions? No. Okay. Well, just if we have a minute. Among the other special collections, I'm going to have time to talk about them all. If you go to the website, nypl.org, you can see a, a list and a description of, the, of the, what, what's in the collections. But there's one that is just totally devoted to tobacco and only works of literature that talk about tobacco. So no Shakespeare, because he never mentioned uh, uh, tobacco. Um, and only part of the manuscript for uh, the importance of being earnest, only where, where smoking is, is mentioned. So, you know, that's the kind of eccentric uh, collection that, that uh, some people created. But, uh, okay, well, th thank you, Tara, for the opportunity to do this tour. And thank you for coming on this beautiful evening uh, and giving time to the New York Public Library. It, the plan is for the Schwarzman Building to reopen in September. Um, right now, it's by appointment only to do research uh, limited. But by the way, all the collections are digitized. Anything that's not under copyright is digitized. So uh, if you, if you, I mean, I'm not all that tech savvy, but you can do a digital exploration. Also on the website, uh, they have all kinds of interesting blogs from the curators and stuff like that. And so there are ways to stay connected to the library during the pandemic, but in September, it will reopen. You'll be able to go to the treasures exhibit. And I, I hope to see you there. Also, every docent uh, gives a different tour. I don't always give the same tour. There are more, more stories than can fit into an hour. So it's worth taking a personal uh, uh, tour if you're there. Thank you. It was a wonderful tour.